Hello everyone and thank you for joining us. Uh, welcome to uh, next in our series of the uh, Improving Healthcare with Simulation Workshops. Uh, delighted to say today that uh, we are coming uh, live from the IHI conference in Florida. And uh, on the, uh, the call today, um, we're going to be talking about process improvement innovation and in particular looking at lean and simulation. Um, joined by Dr. John Bolton, uh, IHI Phil, uh, and rheumatologist, and also our own Claire Cordeaux and Brittany Hagdorn. Uh, just a couple of things to run through. Just a few housekeeping uh, slides here. Uh, just before we get started, uh, just everyone's obviously muted uh, just now. Uh, so um, if you do have any questions, please post them into the chat panel, which is down on your right hand side. And uh, the recording and slides will be available at the, on simulatehealthcare.com. And we'll also be emailing those out to everyone uh, as well who's attended and registered for the session. So, process improvement, innovation, lean and simulation, and we're going to hand over uh, first off to Claire Cordeaux from Simulate. Thanks very much, Stephen, and um, hello, everybody. Um, uh, just before we kick off, really, um, it's, it's delightful to be able to talk to everyone from here at the conference, the IHA conference. And I think we're sitting here um, very, very inspired by all the stories that we've been hearing about improvement um, and just the energy that people have here to to try and drive some improvement forward in, in healthcare. Um, so with, with, with that kind of spirit, um, our, our contribution really to some of the thinking um, around improvement today is around bringing lean and simulation together. Um, and one of the things we've been thinking about is how can we bring the, the compelling, powerful techniques in improvement together to, to really make a difference. Um, what we wanted to um, just really start with is just the messages from research. Um, the Warwick Business School at Warwick University has been uh, undertaking a project on looking at using lean and simulation together. And I just wanted to flag up a couple of lessons really from, from that research. Um, what they point out is that the techniques aren't very often used together and how, how surprising that is because um, they are so useful in process improvement and service delivery. Um, and on the next slide, um, one of the things that they talk about, um, that they found out from their uh, research with the um, SimLean project participants on the next slide there, Stephen, um, was that what people felt that simulation could add to lean was that dynamic process map. Um, being actually able to see in that virtual world how activity flowed from one part of the process to the next and being able to immediately ask those what-if questions um, and understand what the impact might be and, and the, what people were saying was that that really does help to accelerate understanding of the problems and of the potential solutions. Um, so on what we wanted to be able to really address in this webinar today was to think about um, uh, simulation and lean. We've, what we did was we created a couple of models for people at IHI really to test out um, how people would respond to seeing a simulation of a lean concept to um, enable people to think about that um, and to get some feedback and we're going to be talking a bit about some of that feedback um, and implications really for some of our work, some of our thinking about how we should be uh, using our tools in simulation to support improvement and then we'll hand over to, uh, to John to talk about his reflections. Our big question really um, was why don't lean and simulation communities work together more? Um, they both do fantastic work. They're both methodologies which are very powerful change agents. Um, and we know that we need all help that we can get to improve healthcare. So, so why don't these communities come together? And our hypothesis, which is on the next slide, is that um, actually probably if you use one particular technique, one particular methodology, you're probably passionate about it and you don't necessarily look to another methodology um, so people don't combine those um, approaches and we think that actually both approaches together 
um, can be very helpful. And but if you do simulations to explain lean concepts, that might be a way of, of bridging the gap. So that was kind of what we wanted to come to um, IHI to test out. And we've developed a lean sim toolkit, which allows us to show lean principles through simulation um, and to quickly experiment with some of the parameters um, to see what the results might, uh, might be like. So um, that's what we're, we're going to look at. I'm going to hand over to Brittany now um, to talk about uh, sort of the, the Lean Sim toolkit and to show that. Now Brittany is our lead in North America, um, but she's also a Six Sigma black belt. Um, and she's also used sim simulation. So as a practitioner in healthcare, she's been through this journey of using the different improvement techniques um, and can see their power. So she's very well placed to, to talk about that. So to be with me. Great. Thanks, Claire, for that um, introduction. Um, I think you really gave us a good perspective on um, the value of, of combining the tools. Um, so really quickly, I'm just going to walk you through um, got some slides here that show uh, what the models uh, look like. Um, and these models are, are the ones that we are um, giving away at IHI, so really trying to get people's feedback on them. Um, so there's, there's five models in the tool set itself. We're just going to go through the first two uh, today. Um, and the first one that we're going to look at is um, the demand smoothing. And um, really what this, is, this model is designed to show is the difference between um, uh, unex unplanned, unexpected arrivals, um, and actually implementing a schedule um, in a clinic setting, in this case, uh, a primary care setting. Um, and and is, is anybody who's, who's youth lean and, and um, worked in improvement understands the variability in um, arrival times and not being able to necessarily plan your capacity uh, very well really results in lower utilization and, um, and can um, affect the way that um, you're able to serve your patients, resulting in longer wait times and things of that sort. Um, when we run these models, um, you can see on the left there is actually um, what the, the model looks like. And then on the right, we have a, a few buttons we can use. Um, when we run it before the schedule, what we see is actually patients piling up in the waiting room um, as they arrive over the course of the day. And that's really due to that um, the um, randomness of you know the day-to-day the -day operations that you would see if, if you didn't have um, a planned schedule for your clinic. Um, when we run after the schedule, um, obviously we want to have a fair comparison. So what we do is we set the schedule to be the same um, average time between patient arrivals, so that we're, we're comparing the same number of patients. Um, but actually what we see is quite a few patients turned away, about um, an 8% um, of patients aren't able actually to get in to see their provider because of the queuing and the wait times that are, they're experiencing. Um, we see fewer patients um, once we implement a schedule. We see less time in the system. Um, so patients, um, obviously, as they wait less, they're going to spend less time in the office. Um, and then we see increased utilization of our staff, um, both our primary care physician as well as our nurse. Um, because we have that, that schedule time, um, we're seeing more patients, and therefore uh, their utilization is actually going to increase. <clears throat> what we built into this model that I think is really useful um, is that you can actually play with the settings yourself. Um, so you can go in, you can change the schedule, uh, you can change the average time between patient arrivals, um, you can change um, the way patients arrive over the course of the day, um, and really build it so that it, it represents um, the world that, that you're living in um, to, to be able to use that as a communication tool. Um, to staff and to other people who uh, you need to explain some of these concepts to. So I think that's really powerful, and we'll, we'll go on to the next one here in a moment. Um, great. Thanks, Stephen. Um, this one is designed to show a, a little bit of a different concept, um, which is a uh, single PP flow um, and really the value of reducing batch size. And so often what we see in um, our daily lives as well as our professional lives that we want to batch things, right? We put all of our receipts in at the same time. We want to um, do all of the dishes at the same time. We tend to batch pharmacy orders. We tend to batch um, a lot of things in our lives. And so what this model is, is designed to show is actually um, why that's not the most efficient way uh, to, to process the work that needs to be done. 
Um, so what we have in this model, um, and this is this is designed to represent a hospital pharmacy, um, where we know that there is um, frequently batching that happens. Uh, so if we have orders coming in throughout the day uh, for an inpatient unit or for an outpatient um, uh, requirement, you know, often you're going to see a pharmacy tech match up a few, right? I've got five orders for aspirin. All right, now I'm going to fill all the aspirin orders, then I'm going to move on to the next drug. And actually what, what happens then if, if you run the model is you're going to see um, increased wait times, right, when you do that. Um, and so the, the top line there shows you the batching system. Um, the bottom one, when we run it, shows you the single piece um, approach. And, and so with the same arrival coming in there on the left, um, we see that as we reduce batch size from 10 to 5 to 1, um, or whatever, whatever parameters you want to um, play with, you're going to see um, the same throughput. Um, but you're going to reduce the number of units in your system, right, the number of orders that are waiting to be filled. Um, and you're also going to reduce the amount of time that it takes to fill that order. Um, so again, a very, very simple model, um, but, but really powerful in that you can um, quickly understand, quickly visualize the impact that some of these concepts can have um, when they're implemented in healthcare. Um, great, Stephen. Let's, um, Move to the next slide. I think you know we've been demonstrating these models to uh, lots of folks at the IHI conference, and really interested in what they have to say. Um, we've gotten very good feedback, I think, and and there's two quotes here on the slide. Um, one of two of, of many that we've received, um, and we've really been trying to focus on speaking to folks who teach me. Um, who implement lean themselves, who need to gain buy-in, who need to communicate some of these concepts to others in their organization. I'm not going to read the quotes to you. You can, you can read them. Um, but I think it really captures the essence of what we're trying to do with these models, really trying to bridge that gap between the lean practitioners and the, the simulation um, folks. And you can see there, I think, one of the things that I know I've struggled with and it sounds like many others have as well, when you're trying to teach lean, um, some of those concepts can be counterintuitive. Um, like I just mentioned with batching, um, you know, we, we have a tendency, it's um, natural we all do it, to try to batch things together, right, because we think we're going to be more efficient um, when we do things that way. And that's actually not necessarily true. Um, and so, so having that... Um, that tool to be able to explain things that can be counterintuitive is, is really useful. Um, there's also a, a lot of value, I think, in translating the lean um, terminology, the lean examples that we use to teach into a healthcare context. Um, frequently, when you hear folks talking about lean, there's a lot of jargon, there's a lot of um, terminology, and there's also a lot of examples that are based on manufacturing settings, um, based on um, other service industries, there really isn't a lot that's specifically targeted to healthcare. And so building these tools and, and the feedback, feedback that we've been getting is that um, it's, it's really valuable to put it in that healthcare context. Um, our favorite quote uh, we just wanted to share with you was from uh, Sarah. She is um, part of an evidence-based uh, decision support group um, at a, a local hospital. And when she saw the models, um, her, her first question was, why isn't everybody already doing this? So we thought that was uh, really great to hear um, her, her positive um, perception of, of the tools. Um, so hopefully she'll be taking those back to her, her community and using them to um, help her improve uh, her organization as well. Stephen, if we can um, move past to the um, next slide, we wanted to share a few things as well. Um, not just about the lean simulation tools themselves, but more generally, what have we heard about um, at IHI and what, is, what do people have to say? Um, the first thing that I think has been really um, repeated is that the simulations are a really powerful communication tool. Um, we all struggle in our own organizations to, communi to communicate difficult concepts, um, to gain buy-in, to um, engage stakeholders. 
and, and that these simulations can really provide a, a mechanism for doing that. Um, of course, we, we do want to um, mention that the passion of the clinicians um, that we're speaking to this week um, is alive and well. Um, everybody is very excited about doing the right thing um, and really having a, a big impact on the quality and the um, perceptions of care um, and the patient experience as well as um, the actual clinical care itself. So, you know, it's, it's always great um, and inspiring, we find, to, to speak to the clinicians here. Um, the one thing that we do, um, of course, all run into is the day-to-day -day tasks um, that consume our, a large portion of our time, and that it, folks really do struggle to find the time to think about lean, to think about improvement, um, and to really to follow through on the action items and all of the great ideas that we have. Um, you come to a conference like this and everyone is really excited about all of the things that they're learning and that they're sharing and, and the, the new ideas that have come out. And um, it can be a struggle sometimes to take that back and, and really make the time to implement. And so, you know, we're hearing that message again, um, as I'm sure you've all experienced. And so what I think we, we're hearing is just that we need to continue to um, develop ways and methodologies and tools to make that process easier. And then finally, the last thing that everybody is talking about is the need for evidence-based solutions. Um, the, the lean side of um, the toolkit is really good at, at cultural change management, um, but we also do need to be making decisions that are based on evidence. And so I think that's potentially where there's a lot of opportunity um, to bring the, the simulation piece in together. Um, so what does that mean for us? On our next slide, we've outlined, I think, three really important implications um, when we think about bridging this cultural gap between lean and between simulation. The first being that simulation is a really powerful means of engaging stakeholders. Um, like I said earlier, as we've been demoing these lean toolkit uh, models, really getting a lot of positive feedback about the visual nature of them and about the power to um, the, the ability to use these as a communication tool. Um, the second uh, big learning for us is um, that more educational models are actually needed. Um, going back to those, those quotes we heard from, from the Lean Toolkit users, <clears throat> they have a lot of teaching to do and a lot of adult education to do, and the organizations in healthcare have a lot of uh, learning that needs to be done. And so we need to continue to really focus on educational models um, to bring those lean concepts to life and help people implement them more quickly um, and come up to speed more quickly. And then finally, I think the biggest um, implication for us is that simulation is, is really beginning to show um, how useful it can be um, when approaching the IHI challenge. Um, listening to um, the, keynote, um, the keynote speakers this week, there's a lot of folks talking about patient-centered service models um, and, and really trying to move away from the, um, the fee-for-service, the, um, the high-volume um, care processes that we've been uh, using traditionally up till now and, and moving back towards that patient-centered model. How do we bring the patient into that conversation? How do we help them um, take more control over their care? How do we really focus on the outcomes that matter to them? And then we're finding that simulation is going to be a really useful tool in, in addressing that. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, great. So the way we look at this, um, with all of those learnings in mind, the question is, so how do we actually physically bring these tools up? Um, and so even if we can bring up some of those um, the yellow idea bubbles, um, what we've done is outlined here um, in blue the standard lean approach to, um, right? You start with some value stream mapping, you identify opportunities, you prioritize those, um, develop your current stages, say, pilot, implement, and then eventually, of course, we need to include the sustain piece, which is so critically important. And so 
what we what we've been thinking about is how do we integrate simulation into that process, and how do we enhance the lean tool. Um, we know that that continuous improvement, that process improvement um, tools are are really um, oriented towards um, continual learning, continual growth, um, continual development. And what we think is that actually simulation, um, integrating simulation into the the lean and the Six Sigma um, uh, approach to, to improvement is actually kind of um, continuously improving, continuously improving continuous improvement. Right? Um, it's really what we're trying to do. So, so a couple of ideas here. Um, I'll just run through these real quick. Um, first off, we think there's a lot of opportunity to incorporate variability into value stream mapping. Um, anybody who's done a value stream map before, you know, you go to you do the Gemba, you go to the floor, you do the observations, and you write down what you see, right? Which is great and is really important. Um, but but we know that there's variability over time, and that that one snapshot um, moment in time may not represent um, the full distribution of, of what happens every day. And so, using a tool like Simulate to map out those processes in a simulation tool um, then it allows you to incorporate that variability and, and see how all of those pieces play together and have a more dynamic model. Of, of what's happening in your environment. It also allows you to visualize the improvement results, right? Um, because as you simulate, um, you're actually going to see patients moving through your process. You're going to see trays moving through um, your process, whatever it is that um, you're, you're looking at. Um, it also, I think, is really interesting to think about how do we understand the dependencies um, between projects. I know that. Um, one of the, the first projects that I worked on myself, um, we had six or seven different projects as part of a, a bigger improvement program. And understanding the order in which we needed to do them, how they played together, um, and how they would impact each other um, was, was a really important part of us being successful in that program. Had we done them um, in a different order, we would have had some, some big issues. So um, using the simulation to look at all those dependencies in that virtual world can be really powerful. Um, the, the next thing I do want to mention is um, setting evidence-based targets. I think, you know, of course, when we do an improvement program, we want to improve it as much as we can, right? If we're looking at a process, we want to do it to the best um, job that we can. But sometimes there's a challenge in distinguishing between um, what, distinguishing what the right uh, improvement target is. Um, if I say we need to improve this um, throughput by 30% or we need to reduce wait time by 30%, um, is that enough? Is it too much? Does it need to be 25%? Does it need to be 40%? Um, using simulation, we can test those scenarios out to really understand the impact of, um, of what those targets will, will do. Um, a few more, um, three more ideas here. Um, it will allow you to um, validate your current state, actually. Right, if we, um, as, as we all know, right, we go to the floor and we talk to the folks who live the process, oftentimes there's something that's going to be missed, right, as you map it out. Um, and using the simulation to quickly run through it, see the results, find out that they don't match um, the real experience in, in the day-to-day um, the -day operations, we can figure out where those gaps are before we, um, or we plan our future state. And then finally, um, you know, the reducing risk, if we can pilot any sort of improvement program in a virtual world first, um, in the simulation first, obviously we can reduce risk. Um, and then finally, um, the last one uh, that I've already talked about a little bit is just gaining buy-in. Um, and, and that can be really powerful, and we've already touched on that. We can do that. OK, great. So those are some um, thoughts from IHI. And uh, hopefully we've, um, I know we've gone through a lot of that very quickly, but um, hopefully you found some of that interesting and, and got some ideas about um, what you can take home and implement in your um, organization. So now I'm going to pass it over to John and uh, look forward to hearing his thoughts. Uh, thank you, Brittany. Thank you, uh, Claire. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm speaking to you from Sheffield in the UK. Unfortunately, I uh, had to leave the, uh, the forum early this year, but as they've said, there's, there's several thousand very interested uh, improvers out there, uh, all doing great work. So just very briefly about me, I'm a physician, I'm a rheumatologist um, by background. Um, up until um, a couple of weeks ago, I was the clinical lead for quality improvement in, in Sheffield, um, and 
I've just recently finished um, what's probably been one of the most amazing and transformative years of my uh, my career is I actually got the opportunity to spend a year at the IHI as one of their quality improvement fellows and one of the two of the things that I really focused on was um, understanding principles of high reliability and the link um, between high reliability and system-wide flow very very strong link and as you actually start to to look at harm and safety there's a very strong link between uh, failure and flow uh, and harm events um, I've always had an interest in simulation and modeling as I've been doing uh, quality improvements and I, I've been very fortunate that I've had a very close um, friend and colleague um, in Sheffield, Gary Fothergill, who's been uh, supporting and mentoring me for, for quite some time. Um, there's my Twitter handle if anybody's interested. Um, quite big in the social network um, scene at the IHI at the moment. Um, Twitter, uh, if you follow uh, hashtag IHI25 forum, you'll see just the most amazing stream of information from the forum. So I'm just going to reflect on um, some of the comments that the IHI community has said, um, and I think these are just so true as as, uh, as Brittany's described them. Is a lot of the concepts that we talk about in lean, and not just lean, maybe um, beyond lean, and in terms of operations management and some of the improvement work that we do, is is often very counterintuitive and also often very very different to the way that we've either managed uh, healthcare or the way that we've, we we actually manage uh, our own services. Um, and I'll, I'll show you some of the models that we, we, we've developed in Sheffield and, and I think it's I think it's very true. Simulations are are very powerful but merely just using a, uh, a straightforward model from industry makes it very very difficult to translate and often I think most people on the call will probably uh, associate with this is it often frustrates the physicians and the nursing staff as you start talking about factories and uh, we're, we're building something similar to cars. Um, why isn't every, every hospital using this, this methodology? And I think the, the answer partly is I have absolutely no idea. Um, but I truly believe that we should be. Um, so here's one of the challenges is that, that there is amazing work and knowledge and learning uh, regarding uh, industrial manufacturing and there's, there's really quite an amazing book, Factory Physics, um, which describes in detail um, how the operations of a factory work. And if you go through it, whilst it's an amazing book, you need more than a degree in mathematics to understand it because the maths is really quite complex. Now, I believe there's a similar book somewhere waiting to be written, Hospital Physiology uh, for the Hospital. The challenge is, is, is how do we translate the complex mathematics um, to the frontline staff who are busy, and are working uh, at the front line with expertise in patient healthcare and safety, not necessarily um, understanding in, in depth the flow of patients around the system. So just as an example, here's one of the challenges that I think we've got. Most of you are probably aware and have a deep, deep understanding and knowledge of, of Q theory. And one of the things I'd always set my um, heart on doing is actually trying to understand it for myself. Um, I achieved that, but if you look at the equation, does anybody see a patient in there? It's very challenging to to, to frontline staff who aren't necessarily used to this the, these sorts of methodologies to see a patient and how it actually affects and interacts um, with them every day at the front line. So here's one of the pieces that we worked on is in, in terms of trying to understand uh, acceptable weighting in highly variable, moderately variable, and low variability systems. It's all very interesting and it's all great to have done in a spreadsheet model, but as people had said earlier, translating that to a group of frontline staff who are short of time actually takes a considerable amount of time. So one of the things that I've been very interested in is I've used simulate and I, I admit to being no expert in the, uh, in the modeling is actually developing very simple models uh, to translate. So here's a very simple key model very similar to the to the to the previous uh, calculation, but it's much easier to understand for a member of staff. There's there's little people uh, sat on the screen. Uh, there's a service area, and there's people passing through. And at the same time, it gives us a considerable amount of data, which enables a much more um, effective, uh, open conversation with the staff, the frontline workers, um, as opposed to having a Q model, a graph, uh, which is sometimes difficult to translate. <coughs> Excuse me. So. 
IHI's work is based very much um, on Deming's um, work many, many years ago. Now, Deming described a, um, a methodology described as the system of profound knowledge, and as Deming um, describes profound, he means deep knowledge uh, and understanding of systems, as in how um, each of the components within the system are interconnected and how um, they interact with each other. We need an understanding and a deep understanding and knowledge of variation, as, uh, as Brittany has, has described, and how that variability and the variation that we not only create but is actually created uh, naturally interacts with the system. We need to have a theory of knowledge in terms of understanding how the system is interacting, but also then being able to learn and start to predict how the system will behave if we were to change anything. And then we need an understanding and a knowledge of psychology. Um, IHI talks at length about how we, we go about the improvement journey. And they talk about the three steps of um, will, ideas, and execution. There's a great deal of um, psychology and will generation in all the work that we're doing in terms of improvement, and sometimes actually challenging those mental models and encouraging buying buy and ownership takes an awful lot of time and uh, coaching. So one of the things that I fundamentally believe is that there's an opportunity for simulation to actually impact um, all of these areas. So we can use simulation to understand the system, to understand variation, to start using it to generate new knowledge and starting to predict, but also starting to convince um, and coach and actually challenge other people's um, mental models of the world that they work within. And I'm just going to walk you through just a couple of uh, simulations which we've developed over the last couple of years that we've used in various um, environments. So the first one is an understanding of the systems. So this is probably one of the first um, models that we went on to develop. Um, one of the things that we, I was originally tasked with was understanding um, opportunities for improvement in quality in an outpatient or ambulatory setting. And one of the things that we were tasked with understanding is um, capacity to meet the uh, demand, not just for new patients, but for follow-up patients in chronic disease um, specialities. Uh, now, in the UK, it's often very, very basic in the terms of its planning, and we often use very basic uh, ratios known as the uh, follow-up to new ratio to plan. It's historically been viewed as a very uh, useful marker of the efficiency of the system, which as you, we, we use these simulations, we realize very, very quickly it isn't um, an efficient marker. Um, and one of the things that we started to, to understand quite quickly is rather than focusing on the number of new patients we should be seeing each week, we need to start to understand how we manage the follow-up pool and how we look to manage and discharge those patients more effectively to give not only a better patient-centered uh, service, but also open up access, which actually reduced waiting time for new patients. So Deming has probably got more, more famous quotes about quality than anybody else, but this is one of his most famous. So if I had to reduce my message for management to just a few words, I'd say it all had to do with reducing variability. And I think that this is so true, but understanding variation is incredibly challenging. And now historically, we often have planned for average, but unfortunately systems never actually release work at an average rate. It's often below average. And always 50% of the time we'll be below capacity um, if we do plan for average. So Deming was was incredibly correct in, in terms of his understanding. One of the pieces that work that we were doing in Sheffield was um, with a um, team from the cystic fibrosis um, unit, and they'd set off on a on a very large, quite significant piece of work trying to ensure that they developed capacity over the coming years for uh, for their patients. They um, were an incredible team, very hard working, um, but found that they were that they were working um, far harder than they, they realized and their clinics were heavily overbooked every week, um, but also highly variable. And one of the things that we'd actually set up to try and understand variability it was a very basic simulation model to see whether reducing the variability in terms of follow-up interval would actually improve their system. And what we found is we, we produced the model. And if you look at the, uh, 
this chart, um, if you look at baseline, so their, their, their system, they were varying every week um, between seeing just under 20 patients a week and could see anything up to 50, 60, uh, 70 patients. Now, as they started to actually think about how could they reduce the follow-up, uh, the variability in follow-up frequency, so this example, seeing one patient every three weeks, another patient every six, another, another patient every three months, as they started to standardize it and start to think about reducing variation and reducing variability, the actual demand on the service actually started to drop within the simulation. So as they drop the variation, you can see not only do the, uh, do the box plots actually narrow, you also start to see reduction in the actual number of appointments required each week. So one of the incredible learnings that they have from, the, from this simulation is yes, they can reduce variation, Two, it reduces their workload, and three, it would actually potentially reduce the amount of appointments that they actually are required to deliver. Now, a heavily overbooked clinic, if any physicians ever actually worked within a heavily overbooked clinic, is not patient-centered and is often um, deeply challenging for both the patients and the staff. So any opportunity to actually reduce and um, book clinics appropriately are uh, hugely valuable for the, for the value for the patient. So, in terms of knowledge, this was a piece of work that probably cemented my, my learning of the use of simulation, but probably lost me an awful lot of friends in the first instance. So, as a rheumatologist, I'm very interested in actually um, managing arthritis very, very early in, the, in its disease, as we, we know now that will improve outcome quite considerably uh, and reduce future demands uh, on healthcare. Uh, there's a strong move in the UK to actually set up clinics specifically for uh, early arthritis. And in Sheffield, we were, we were no different to any of the other uh, services. And essentially, this was a very basic, very basic, um, straightforward, very simple model to try and explain um, how we would go about doing it and whether we would have enough capacity to meet the demand. And essentially, a patient is seen at new, and then if they're identified as having uh, an early inflammatory arthritis, they'll be seen alternately between the physician and the nurse over the coming 12 months and then subsequently discharged to, to a general clinic. And this was a very simple basic model. Um, there was very little in terms of variability in it. It was just quite simply to generate the knowledge and understand the service. So the original service before we used the, the simulation had been set up to deliver 10 medical follow-up slots, 12 nursing uh, follow-up slots. And as we said, this is a very simple model. If you look at the graphs on the left, the, 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 the blue, the red lines are uh, the results of, of um, one of the tests, one of the runs. And we were predicting that actually we would probably run out of capacity at just over six months if there was 10 slots for the, for the physician, 12 slots for the nurse. Now, originally this was ignored. Um, by the by, the, uh, by colleagues who suggested we, that they'd be fine, um, and unfortunately, the clinic was abandoned after nine months because they were unable to deliver the care. Uh, and unfortunately, the waiting time for it to be seen with an inflammatory arthritis actually went up, didn't come down. So there was a huge um, learning for not just me as a as a physician and um, with an interest in quality improvement, but also the opportunity to actually start generating knowledge and learning as we're developing new. Uh, models of care to see whether actually we have the capability, the capacity to actually deliver it. So and finally, I'm just going to talk about Deming's um, psychology. As I returned back from um, uh, my IHI fellowship, we were doing a piece of work um, on a day case treatment unit in terms of trying to improve flow, um, whilst at the same time also trying to improve safety of the unit as we've noticed that there's quite a few uh, medication there is increasing um, stress and burden on the staff, and this is a this is the model that I developed um, with very strong support uh, from my colleague uh, Gary Fothergill in Sheffield. Um, essentially, what we were trying to understand is how patients um, flowed through the system and how many patients would end up on the unit um, at any one time. So we 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 had taken the data. This is perhaps a little bit more detailed model than just purely a simple one. We've taken the data, we understood the variability in, in infusion times, and we've started um, to actually uh, model it. And if you actually look at the, uh, the, the graph, the chart on the top in terms of patients on the unit, it varies uh, from no patients at all, all the way up to six patients, which um, 
for a member of the nursing staff who is just managing these patients on, on his or her own, it's actually quite a considerable amount of work. Now, as we look through this um, in real life and patients were coming in, there were six, seven patients on the unit, we were starting to see uh, errors, potential harm events. So any opportunity to actually reduce that workload is an opportunity to improve care. So this is this is um, the first simulation model that we did. This take this took real life data in terms of um, actually what was happening on the unit. And if you actually see, it's highly variable. Up to six patients on a on a day, um, and it could take anything up to eight um, eight or so hours uh, um, on the day. And then the next slide, um, we started to change and we started to actually ask if we scheduled more effectively and brought these patients in more effectively what could happen um, in terms of improvement. Well, we see two things. Is one is that it finishes uh, earlier in the day, so there's less time overall, but also we're seeing less patients on the unit. So we've dropped to five uh, from six, but there's only ever five patients on for a very short period of time. This was, this, this was quite a considerable um, change in terms of the discussion that we began to have with the nursing staff, because at this point they were very resistant to thinking about a schedule and they didn't feel that they needed one. As he started to see the opportunities to offload demand, charts really started to change the conversation. It, it didn't it didn't just move from buy-in um, in terms of lean concepts. They actually started to own the problem of actually how do we schedule on this unit and what is it that they need to do to actually achieve that. So everything that we do at IHI in, in terms of um, improvement uses uh, the model for improvement developed by um, API, which asks. The three questions is what are we trying to accomplish, how will we know that a change is an improvement, what changes can we make that will result in an uh, improvement, and these three questions really frame the PDSA uh, for that um, particular piece of improvement. Now we use PDSA cycles every day in improvement, but as you go through the, the three the four models that I've just presented, is that there are PDSA cycles in the way that we actually develop them, but actually as we were starting to change and actually ask the questions of what if what if we change uh, discharge sheet um, for follow-up? What if we change the follow-up interval? These are all PDSA cycles that we're now doing virtually. And the huge opportunity, the huge benefit of simulation is that the opportunity to do multiple PDSA cycles in a very short period of time that actually gains confidence when we're doing PDSA cycles out in the real world. It gives huge opportunity and huge confidence uh, that our predictions are probably correct. So, in summary, for me, I, I think simulation is a really useful tool, and I hope over the next couple of years as I start to be able to move from simple tools to something a little bit more uh, complex, it, it really does enable a deeper understanding of systems, enables us to translate in um, difficult and often counterintuitive concepts, uh, and it gives us the opportunity to, to create virtual PDSA cycles, which we're able to do really very rapidly. Now, I don't believe that models need to be um, overly complex, and I think sometimes simple models are often more effective as they enable much much more effective conversation and dialogue between uh, myself as a uh, improvement um, advisor and um, the frontline staff um, who often don't have either the, the, the language or the knowledge and background of improvement. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you, John. Um, um, very, very interesting uh, take on there. And, um, uh, you know, I think uh, things that we, we can all get on, on board with in terms of the, using lean and simulation together and really that less is more approach. Um, I'm just going to hand over to Claire, um, who's just going to wrap up here. And uh, Claire, if you're okay to pick up from there. Yes, yeah, thanks very much, Stephen. And, and John, I wanted to say a very big thank you uh, to you for that presentation. Really interesting stuff and, and love the things that, that Sheffield is doing. And it's just great to see that the, the, the simple models that you've been producing have really had that kind of powerful impact in explaining what's going on and helping people to understand it. Um, and, and we certainly valued meeting with you here at IHI and, and, and think, you know, thinking about the future work and, that you're going to be doing and looking forward to hearing about that. Um, I just wanted to say briefly that um, for people listening on the call, um, you're very welcome to try the simple lean sim uh, models that Brittany talked about a little bit earlier. There's a, a link on, on that um, last slide there, uh, which will give you access. You can, you can download them, you can play with them. What we would really, really love is your feedback 
um, on those models and see whether you think they're useful as learning tools, as training tools, um, any other ideas you've got about how we might be able to produce these simple models that enable you to be able to get over some key improvement messages. So we'd like to see the group that we talk to on a regular basis of these webinars is the community of people that is helping us all bring simulation in, into healthcare improvement. Um, so I'd, I'd just like to finish on that, Stephen. I don't know if there are any questions that have come up over the seminar, uh, the webinar that, that um, you think we should be picking up now, um, or we can certainly use the LinkedIn Simulation Health group, um, and you can also build in, in just, just email us and, and we'll pick any of those up. But is there anything we need, we need to pick up there, Stephen? Yeah, I think we're clear. we've got we've got time for for one question. Um, I think in there, uh, and I'll just uh, you know, field one question, and the other questions we'll get back to after um, after the, the webinar, as, as Claire said. Um, so, a question that this came in is, uh, I guess this is for everybody. Uh, what are the key lean metrics that are included within the the toolkit and uh, within lean healthcare models? Uh, I'm not sure who wants to to pick that up, uh, Claire or Brittany. Certainly on the on the side of the toolkit. Yeah, let me just jump in on that. Um, the key metrics that are um, that you saw in the presentation um, really are around throughput, right? how many patients are we seeing or how many pharmacy orders are we um, completing um, in, in a given day. Um, so that's the first one, obviously, that is going to be most important. Um, we also had um, utilization, um, time and system, and average inventory um, would be the four metrics that really you're going to want to see um, included in any sort of analysis, right? What, what is the impact on the amount of um, work that's being done, how many people are in the system, or how many um, orders are waiting to be processed, um, average time in system, how long am I actually waiting, um, and then, of course, um, the, the resource utilization and things as well. Um, in the, the demand smoothing, we also added the patients turned away or um, left without being seen um, metric simply because um, in that environment, that's going to be a really important um, thing to track as well. Not so much a, a lean metric, but um, a patient metric, right? That's, that's really important for those um, people that we're trying to serve. That's great. Thanks, Brittany. And quite interesting hearing you, hearing you come through. I mean, I know who the, the questions actually come through from is um, one of our, our guys who, who works quite heavily in manufacturing. And obviously, a lot of the, the terms and the processes are the same, but, you know, Again, on to, to one of John's main points, which was, you know, that the the, the patients obviously got to be at the heart of that, and that's something that um, we always uh, we always look at. I don't know if you want to um, go on top of that, John, in terms of um, adding to that point. Sorry, just repeat the question for me, Stephen. Yeah, I was just saying, you know, a lot of the uh, the metrics that the Brittany has uh, mentioned there, the question actually came in from uh, one of our uh, guys who's more useful, used in manufacturing, and a lot of the terms are the same, but, you know, obviously just to re reaffirm your point that you made on, uh, you know, the patient always has to be at the heart of that, and that's something that was missing in those earlier models. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things, and one of the things that's really very different between healthcare and manufacturing is, we have the customer and the uh, the individual or the object that we're having to work on at, at that point in the, in the same process and actually they're exactly the same. So the patient is both customer and um, you know individual being serviced. And I, I think the metrics are the same. I think that I think the challenge is is translating the language. I think in, sometimes it's, a, a lot of the lean language is um, is often in Japanese. It's often quite complex. Um, and it's 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 the translation of what actually we're meaning and we're talking about, which I think is one of the challenges, but equally one of the huge opportunities over the next couple of years. Yeah, brilliant. I would agree with that. And certainly, I mean, we can see there's a, a huge demand for it. Certainly, in the interest in this uh, webinar, and um, you know, just to just to close up, thank you again for for everyone. And I know uh, we have had a few issues, but we'll look to put on and uh, certainly send out the, the recording and get the slides up onto simulatehealthcare.com um, and field some of your questions individually. Um, but we'll also uh, look to put on similar uh, you know workshops like this uh, throughout uh, as we move into 2014. Um, 
um, certainly to um, start to start to address some of these um, uh, you know things that we're seeing and to to you know explore what we can do more with. Uh, the software um, within the Lean Sim Toolkit. Um, so thank you again. Just going to close up there. Uh, and again, uh, thank you to the guys over in Florida, uh, Claire and Brittany, and John in Sheffield. And uh, this is uh, thank you again, and uh, we'll see you next time. Cheers.